Hello, everybody. Welcome. Please tell us where you're coming from in the chat. We'll get started in just a minute once we get everybody logged in. Welcome. We're excited for the second session with Alberto Lenz. And if you weren't able to join us for the first session, um, it's on our website, uh, languageadventurepro.com, under webinars. And we have all of our past presentations um, available there so you can catch up um, and see the other ones that we have and we have several more planned yep um, we have we, we have a two-part series coming up uh, July 23rd and 30th and um, that's a Thursday from 5 to 6 30 Central Standard, Standard Time or Mexico City time and that's with Albert Coffey he's a local archaeologist in San Miguel de Allende and uh, the topic is origins of the Aztecs, people of the sun. So don't miss that. You can sign up on our website. We'll put that um, website in the chat. Um, and also, if you have not donated yet for this webinar series, um, the suggested donation is $15. And you can also do that on our website as well. Um, welcome Chicago, North Carolina, San Miguel, um we do mean daylight time <laughs> okay i'm going to put the what the website in the uh, and today we have with us again alberto lenz um hi alberto um, hello hola hola alberto lenz is live in san miguel de Allende in his studio and he is a we're so happy to have him here he's a sculptor a painter and architect and born in mexico city uh, his paintings and sculptures have been exhibited in more than 20 solo shows and 40 group shows in such cities as mexico city guadalajara monterey san miguel de allende new york miami toronto and barcelona he was selected to participate in the Bienal de Monterrey, one of the most celebrated exhibitions of contemporary art in Mexico. And his work is included in various public and private collections in Mexico, the United States, Spain, and Venezuela. In the last several years, he has been engaged in public sculpture, drawing, and jewelry design. And his sculpture and jewelry is phenomenal. Um, you can see some of the samples behind him there. So with that, I'm going to um, pass it over to Alberto. Gracias. Gracias, Ginger. Gracias, Rebecca. Welcome, everyone, to this second session of our webinar on Mexican moralism. Uh, if you see the next slide, can you, we put the next slide, please, Ginger? Uh-huh. Uh, last session, the, the first session, we saw a brief uh, panorama of the Mexican Revolution and the Windsor change in the arts in, in, the, in the beginning of the, of the 20th century. And today we're going to continue, but we're going to see the early beginnings of muralism. This is when the, the Vasconcelos mural painting program really started in the National Preparatory School with the first murals by Rivera, Orozco, and Siqueiros. This is a period that runs from 19, 1921 to 1924. Next session, we'll see the consolidation of the mural painting movement, which is the major works that Rivera and Orozco uh, painted in the Ministry of Education and the National Palace in Mexico City. And for next session, I have a special surprise for all of you because we, I'm going to show you the very, very first, very unknown mural painted by Tamayo, the fourth great master of muralism in Mexico. So this is an unknown work that I, I know where it is, and I, this is going to be a surprise for you. So let's start with the early beginnings of Mexican muralists, please. As we saw in our first session, with the Mexican Revolution from 1910 to 1920, a feverish intellectual movement emerged in Mexico that sought to transform art in pursuit of a new national identity. 
here we saw here we here we have a photo of one of the great masters Diego Rivera of course everybody knows him next nothing can be written about Mexican muralism of course without mentioning Jose Vasconcelos Vas Vasconcelos a key inspirational figure of the cultural moment, movement that followed the Mexican Revolution. Uh, Secretary of Public uh, Education during the government of Álvaro Obregón, the first uh, president after the revolution from 1921 to 1924. Vasconcelos used his political power to implement a new educational and cultural policy. During his term of office, thousands of books written by famous authors from Greek philosophers to the Russian and French novelists were published and distributed at very low prices. But most important, a major literacy program was established throughout that country. Here we, we are looking to two propaganda uh, drawings of unknown doctors, but, but this is a, 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 a like something that was issued at that time to promote this literacy program. Vasconcelo was convinced that the New Mexican society required not only better citizens, but better human beings. And education and culture were the main tools to achieve this. Literacy as the first key action. The second key action was to promote art. Perhaps the most polemical policy of Vasconcelos was that of commissioning rather ignore artists to paint murals on the walls of some important public buildings in Mexico City, starting with this one, the National Preparatory School. This is the central courtyard of the building, which during the colonial period had been the Colegio de San Ildefonso one of the first schools established in the New Spain by the Jesuits. So this is, was a perfect place to start an educational program with art uh, in, a, in an old school. John Charlotte, Fernando Leal, Ramon Cano, Javier Guerrero, and Robert Montenegro, known as Los Modernos, the Moderns, all of them former students of the Academia de San Carlos, were among the first group of selected young artists by, uh, by Vasconcelos. Rivera, Siqueiros, and Orozco will join them very soon. All these young artists were guided by the exhortations for a modern and monumental public art issued to them from Barcelona by Siqueiros. This is a portrait of John Siqueiros painted by Rivera. In 1921, Siqueiros was living in Barcelona. Here he published a cultural magazine called Vida Americana, American Life. In his first and only issue printed in May 20, 1921, Vida Americana included the Siqueiros Manifesto, three appeals to the new generation of painters and sculptures of America for an approach instead with the times. In this way, Siqueiros joined the call for a new monumental public art that as we saw in our first session, Dr. Ad had already made some years before. Some years later, Siqueiros said about this manifesto. In this proclamation, I called for a new study of the problem of monumental art and spoke principally of the need for uniting ourselves with the traditions of our country only for a strong nationalistic art could there come a powerful universal art from local to global. Thus, it was necessary for us to take our country as the point of departure. Vasconcelos was a very clever man and he had the virtue of giving total freedom to artists to carry out their projects without imposing any ideological or aesthetic dogmas on them. These, of course, often brought a strong criticism from the, criticism from the public and many accused him 
of altering the beautiful architecture of the buildings with monkeys and monsters. Almost all the modern painters of that time joined Vasconcelos' mural painting program. In the Mexico of 1921, there were no real alternatives for artists who tried to live from their art. The state was the only source of income for these artists who were paid with salaries of clerks and office assistants according to the square meters of the wall they will paint, working 10 hours per day. It's interesting that to this group of artists, Vasconcelos only asked for speed. He was in a hurry to carry out the murals he commissioned, and he was far from paisalizing or wanting to promote a mural painted movement. He only wanted to educate people. He didn't want a mural painting movement. In 1924, political conflicts with President Alvaro Obregón forced Vasconcelos to resign, and his resignation marks the end of the initial period of Mexican muralists. 1921-1924. Barely three years had passed since the first murals were started in the National Preparatory School. Here we have Álvaro Obregón and Vasconcelos. Álvaro to, to the left and Vasconcelos to the right. Thank you. As we will see in this session, these first murals, sponsored by Vasconcelos, reveal the conceptual technical and political shortcoming of the artists. But however contradictory they are, the early murals painted by Rivera, Sequeiros, and Orozco at the National Preparatory School are not only important works of art by themselves, but also because some of the conceptual and technical concerns of the posterior mural movement were defined from them. The National Preparatory School was an important laboratory, a real incubator, to experiment and put into practice the proposals of what will become one of the most important art movements of the 20th century. This is a view from the street. As you can see, it's a very large and very imposing building. Again, this is a view of the main courtyard. The building is now a museum uh, that belongs to the National University, to UNAM. And by the way, some years ago, I worked there in an office on the top floor. Let's now see the first mural commissioned by Vasconcelos. It's a mural called Creation, and it was painted at the Simon Bolivar Amphitheater. Trying to support his mural painting program on the shoulders of an already famous painter, Vasconcelos commissioned Diego Rivera to paint the first mural in the Simón Bolívar Amphitheater of the National Preparatory School. Here we have a photo of them in a dinner. Vasconcelos is sitting right next right to uh, Diego Rivera. When Rivera started work, uh, work in the Bolivar Amphitheater, he was already 36 years old and an artist of considerable reputation. He had lived several years in Europe, mainly in Paris, participating very actively in the Cubist movement. This is his famous painting, The Zapatista Soldier. He had been a well-known member of the international group of artists representing the different avant-garde movements of the early 20th century, such as Picasso, Brack, Modigliani, Jacob, Kisling, Sutan. This is a painting by Marena Borovieva. Uh, the author of this painting was the first wife of Diego Rivera, whom she met in Paris and, and with whom she had a daughter, a little Marika, who also appears in the painting. Marika later became a well-known classical dancer. Rivera's first mural, mural in Mexico 
the creation, la creación, was painted in encaustic in only 11 months from March 1922 to January 23. Encaustic is a very old technique used by the Greeks and the Romans in which the paint is applied to the wall with hot wax. Characterized by Italian and Byzantine influences, the mural expresses the idea of creation as a product of the dual aspects of male and female in the human race. The Mexican art historian and critic Antonio Rodriguez described this work as a poetic and philosophical medley of Christianity and paganism. In the upper central part of the mural, a blue semicircle symbolizes the primary energy, which is projected in three directions indicated by the three hands. The three hands point with the ring and, the, and index fingers, folding the other three, symbolizing with this gesture the father and mother duality. On the right side of the wall, at the bottom, appears a first group of figures that represent fable, knowledge, erotic poetry, and tradition. Above this first group, tragedy appears with a mask. At the base and the foreground of the entire composition, we can see a naked man symbolizing Adam. The model for this naked man was Javier Guerrero, a young painter and one of the muralists that participated in the mural movement. The figures with golden halos in the Byzantine style are the four cardinal virtues, prudence, justice, strength, and continents. The figure at the top to the left, dressed in yellow, represents science. It is interesting to, to say that science appears on the same wall, the right side wall, with Adam. The left side of the mural is dedicated to the arts, the virtues, Eve, and wisdom. Music appears covered with a cheap, cheap skin and playing a flute. There is, there is also song dressed in red and dance standing with her arms raised. Behind these figures, comedy appears with a big smile. At the base of the panel, again, a naked figure, now a woman with the indigenous face represents Eve. The second group of figures and golden halos is formed by the three theological virtues, charity, hope, and faith. In the upper part, another woman dressed in yellow, making with her hands the, sign, the symbol of infinity, represents wisdom. Again, interesting wisdom appears on the same wall than Eve. In the central part of the mural, the new man, the mestizo, appears with open arms as if wanting to embrace everything. And it emerges from a pyramid covered with tropical plants where the four symbols of the evangelists also appear, the bull, the lion, and the eagle, and the winchman. Christine used his uh, friends and lovers of all of the prominent female figures of the cultural world of time. Here we have Nawi Olin uh, representing erotic poetry.
Tradition is represented by Luz Jimenez, a well-known uh, woman that became the archetype of the Mexican uh, image of women in the, in the modern art of Mexico. A strength is Guadalupe Marin, who was going to be the second wife of Rivera. to Hollywood and was internationally known. Median from that time, look Rivas Cacho. Wisdom is again Luz Jimenez. It's interesting to talk about Luis Jimenez, a Nahuatl woman from the community of Milpalpa, Milpa Alta. He, she was the archetype of indigenous women and the face of national identity in modern art and during the, the first half of the 20th century. This is a painting by Diego Rivera called Mujer Indígena. Here we have Luis Jimenez posing for Ramon Alba La Canal, Fernando Leal and Francisco Diaz at an outdoor painting school in Coyoacán. She's, she was very young, as you can see. And painted by Rivera, Orozco Tamayo, Charlotte, photographed by Tina Modotti and Edward Weston. Uh, she appears in more than 60 important works of modern Mexican art. But she was not only a model, he, Jimenez, Luz Jimenez was also an important uh, promoter of her Nahuatl language and culture. Her modeling work with painters brought her into contact with writer, writers, anthropologists, and linguists, and uh, such as uh, linguist Benjamin Lee and anthropologist Robert Barlow. And she also recounted her life in short stories compiled by Fernando Casitas and Sarah Ford and collaborated with Anita Bremer and John Charlotte to create children's books based on traditional Nahuatl stories. Here we have uh, the photo to the left is a photo taken by Tina Modotti. And to the right, we have one of the books that were uh, published with collaboration with uh, Lucy Menes. This is our tales from the Nahuatl community. Now let's go and see murals painted by David Alfaro Siqueiros. These murals are in a, another area of the National Preparatory School called El Colegio Chico. In January 1922, David Alfaro Siqueiros received the invitation of Jose Vasconcelos to join the painters who were beginning to paint murals at the National Preparatory School and uh, this is in the words of Vasconcelos, create a new civilization drawn from the very bowels of Mexico. In September of that year, a few months before the inauguration of Rivera's decreation, Siqueiros joined a group of painters in the National Preparatory School. He was 26 years old. There were eight books that Siqueiros in a narrow and, as you can see, very poorly lit space, the cube of the staircase of the so-called Colegio Chico, which he chose under the justification that the walls of the main buildings were already distributed among the other painters. We distributed the walls as one will divide a, lo a loaf of bread. Everyone is like Siqueiros will say just later. But this site propitiated that everything about, about around 200 square meters could be covered with wall paintings. In, this is in such a way that Sikeros was able to create uh, what he will later call a plastic unit 
perhaps without a, a conscious intention at that moment. Here we have uh, another view of this plastic unit created by Shikeiros. The creation of these plastic units inspired by the Sixteen Chapel will be one of the most important proposals in Siqueiro's career, reaching its climax many years after in the great mural, The March of Humanity, that we can see in another building in Mexico City that is called the Poliforum Cultural Siqueiros. The first important mural on this staircase is titled The Elements. The early mural was painted in encaustic as, as the same as Rivera's mural, a, te a technique that Siqueiros didn't know well. But he used a torch of gasoline to burn the wax following his idea about the need to use new industrial tools for the, the new art. A woman with strong and muscular arms appears surrounded by geometric, geometric shapes that symbolize the four natural elements, air, wind, water, and earth. Rivera said about this work, this is the work of a somewhat serial Lebanese Michelangelo. Siqueiros himself was very self-critical about his first attempt. He said, I painted the elements, fire, earth, water, wind, inspired by the figure of an angel, more or less in a colonial style. You can imagine the cows. There was no one to tell us, do this or do that. We wanted to help the Mexican Revolution, but we were doing a very bad job of it. The next two important murals painted, painted on the walls of the first landing of the staircase were dedicated to the theme of mestizaje, cultural intermixing, interbreeding. Siqueiros represented this theme with two monumental figures, Indian woman, 1923, to the left, representing the nat Native American part, and San Cristobal, 1923 also, representing the European part and the Spanish spiritual contest. In these murals, there are two things that should be mentioned. Unlike the woman in the elements, which, we, which means Arabic, in this case, the Indian woman has really an indigenous face and is fully identifiable as a Mexican woman. Maybe she's also Luz Jimenez. And the child that is carried by San Cristobal, again, represents the first mestizo, born of the Indian and the Spanish mix. The most important murals due to their technical and thematic solidity are found in the walls of the second floor of the staircase. The first of these murals is called Call to Freedom, was done between 1923 and 1924 and was left unfinished. Here, Siqueiros painted two women with classic figures barefoot and dressed in simple robes who are breaking the chains of slavery. A second mural, also of great importance, is the burial of the martyr worker, 1924. In this work, also left unfinished, Siqueiros represented three strong Mexican men with geometric faces in a clear reference to the Aztec sculptures who carry a coffin painted a very intense blue, a mark with the communist symbols of the sickle and the hammer. This unfinished work represents the first mural of all the muralist movement with a clear political image.
Now we're going to see the first model, this one by Jose Clemente Orozco called Maternity. This model is in the ground floor of the central patio. After living in extreme poverty in New York, Orozco returned to Mexico City in 1920, where he worked as a newspaper cartoonist. At that time, he was already 37 years old and largely ignored as a painter. As the art critic Walter Pax wrote in 1923, he meant nothing to a public hopelessly incapable of appreciating his talent. However, both Walter Pax and Juan Jose Toblada, an important poet of the time, were very enthusiastic about Orozco's talents and they brought him to the attention of Vasconcelos. On July 1923, when Siquerios had already completed his murals in the Colegio Chico, Orozco began maternity. Maternity was the first of a series of murals that Orozco painted on the walls of the central patio. Something interesting about these murals we can see in this photo is that each mural parallels in width to the opening of the colonnade. Orozco first mural displayed the same contradictions as those painted earlier by Rivera and Siqueiros. What happened, Siqueiros wrote later, the movement did not understand that an art directed to the people requ requires certain subjects. To start his mural paintings at the National Preparatory School, making a decision that's not very understandable, at least not for me, Orozco painted a Madonna surrounded by angels in a style that recalls Raphael in the figure of the mother. The mother looks like a Madonna. And we see Botticelli in the figure of the angels. Maternity was painted using the fresco technique, like the murals of the Italian Renaissance. So the reference to Botticelli is very clear also in the technique. So here we are. After a bloody revolution with one million deaths, Orozco decided to paint a Madonna with angels. I have not been able to find an explanation for this. Perhaps uh, he wanted to rid himself of his reputation as a painter ignored or rejected, painting a subject that was not uh, aggressive. Another detail of the same mural. And of course, Botticelli is everywhere in that mural. But as we will see in the third part of this webinar, after this strange first mural, the work of Orozco will take a completely different path, creating later some of the strongest murals painted in National Preparatory School and in the whole mural movement. Uh, I think Orozco is ma mostly, mainly the principal uh, muralist of, uh, of the three great masters. Uh, the reasons of this dramatic change will be discussed in our next session, but here you see uh, maternity uh, to the left and this very famous mural, the trench to the right. And something very interesting is that they are very close to each other in the same, on the same wall in the National Property. As you can see, the difference, uh, the, the change in, in, both in, the, in them is, is dramatic. In his autobiography, published in 1962 by the University of Texas, Orozco described this early stage of the mural movement as a time of preparation during which much trial and error went on and the works produced were only decorative with only timid allusions to history, philosophy, and other themes. Of 
of the experience in the National Preparatory School Seekers Road. There, our first work was produced, ignorant of moralism, ignorant of public art. We began in the most stumbling manner one can imagine. We had yet to form a concept of the difference between, between easel painting and the construction of murals. But the most extraordinary and fundamental problem of all concerned our theme. The, prob the problem of a new thematic concept was tremendous, new, and, and incalculable. So we, we have come to the end of this second session. This is the very, very first beginnings of the of a mural painting. And next session, we'll see the major works, the consolidation of the mural painting movement, as I said, with the major works at the National Preparatory and the Ministry of Education and the National Palace. Thank you. Now we'll open a, a period for answers and questions and your comments. Thank you very much. Alberto, there's one question from William Eddy. He asks if you can touch on the Aztec tradition of muralism and any relationship to the subject at hand. Yes, well, the tradition of muralism in the Aztec civilization and in all the pre-Spanish civilizations in Mexico is very strong, as you know. The Tihuacan was, was full with murals as well as most of the of the buildings and the and the and the temples in the and in, in the Aztec. Uh, excuse me, let me open my video. So yes, there was a strong tradition, but the the muralists didn't look to the tradition in the in this in terms of style, and not even in style, also in, not in terms of theme, only in terms of technique. Because this is interesting, they didn't know how to paint the fresco technique was not known here. And they were making a lot of tests and essays and every, everything was a, a failure. They didn't well, it didn't work well until Javier Guerrero, who was one of the painters and was on an indigenous community, uh, decided to ask his father, who was an albañil, you know, who, who was a, build, a worker from the building construction, and who used to paint houses, how he painted the houses. And the father of Javier Guerrero said, we use nopal for our mix. Uh, our mix is made with a, with a, with that baba, the, the, the pulp of the nopal. And that makes a, that makes a perfect fix, uh, fix, uh, mix for us to paint uh, the walls. And that was the technique of the, of the, uh, Aztec and the, and the 31 civilizations, they also use Nepal. So the link with the Aztec uh, murals is more in terms of the technique using the Nepal than with the theme or the style. Thank you. We have um, two questions from Herida Lenz. I'm wondering if uh, they're in relation to you. Yes, yeah, she's, she's my sister, and I prohibited her to ask questions, but okay, let's go out. <laughs> well, she's got two questions. Why did Siqueiros leave some murals unfinished? Siqueiros was a very political uh, man. He was a very act, act, uh, a strong activist. He was also, he, he was, he left painting unfinished because he was in his political activities, and he was always in, on the run, having enemies everywhere. So uh, this is not strange in Siqueiros. It also happened here in San Miguel with the, as you know, with the mural in the Centro Cultural Negromante in Bellas Artes, because he also left and finished the mural. He had, he had to run from San Miguel because the people were, were angry against him. So this is a very common, uh, something, a, a very common problem with the work of Siqueiros. He was, more political than artist, or he was artist because he was a political uh, activist. So he combined these two things, and that makes him very interesting. Of course, I'm not criticizing him, but that's a real. He, he didn't. He even uh, when he was painting the murals in the, in the National Preparatory, he never appeared, and he sent his assistant to paint up the work because he was busy in his political activities. The next question. Thank you. And the, the next question is, what do you know about Aurora Reyes? 
I don't know much about her. I know she was an important figure in muralism and she was an important uh, uh, painter, but as, uh, uh, as, as happens with the women in this period, they were not recognized as, as, a, as a important artist. And in fact, uh, we are planning, uh, Ginger and Rebecca and me, we are planning to make a special webinar about the women in the, in the, uh, in the Mexican arts, we, because we, I think we have to, uh, to recognize them and to, to show the work because it's very important. So I don't know much about Aurora Reyes. I have heard about her and, and yes, she's in, the, she's in this scenario and we should talk about her in our next webinar. Excellent, we look forward to hearing about that. Mm -hmm. um, question from Beatrice Solomon. Um, what is the state of conservation of the murals currently? Now they are very well conserved because it, now the, this place belongs to the National University and it's a museum and it's open to the public. I hope we can go there when the pandemic uh, is over. So they are very well conserved and they are very, very important uh, works of, of course. Uh, even though they are not the most important works, because as you, as we saw in this in this session, they are very contradictory and very strange. I, I really don't understand the Orozco, the Orozco first mural. No? I don't know why he painted a Madonna with an angel after, and he was a very strong artist. He was, uh, he was terrible strong. So why he decided to do that? But it shows that artists make, even genius make mistakes. And, uh, and we don't have to be afraid of, 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 of doing something. If we're creative people, we, sh we, we have to explore new, new paths, and I, I guess Orozco was exploring new paths, and as well as Rivera, and as well as Sequeiros. They all evolve, and they become a great artist in the next, uh, in the next uh, murals they painted. Thank you. We have another question from your sister. Um, she asks, how difficult is it to paint a mural? Well, depending on the size, but of course, it's very difficult. <laughs> because it's a labor that uh, uh, demands a lot of work. Usually you don't do it alone. You need assistance as they do it. And uh, you need time and you can spend many years doing that. So, uh, that, and that's interesting. That, that question is interesting. Uh, I, I didn't prepare it with my sister, I promise. But that's interesting because it helps to, it helps to say that Tamayo, who was the fourth great muralist, decided to paint the murals on canvas instead of directly to the wall. That uh, facilitated uh, to him to paint the mural in, her, in his studio and then transport the mural to the place that it was going to be shown. So that's something interesting about the Tamayo murals. The most of them are painted on canvas and they're independent from the, from the from the wall, and I once I was uh, I was a very close friend with Ch Jose Chavez Morel, who was also very famous muralist here in Guanajuato. So I was I was his friend, and I, I saw him working, and he also did that. He he painted the murals on an independent canvas, and then he transported the murals to the place that was going to be shown. So that make it more easy. But even, even just painting a huge a huge format painting that demands a lot of work and a lot of time and a lot of uh, imagination. Can it still be called a mural if it's not painted directly on the wall? It's painted yes. Directly. Well, it seems so because it, it is, nobody knows it's independent. It, it doesn't, you don't see it. Uh. And, and it, because of the big size, it becomes a mural painting because of the size, mm -hmm. even though it's not painted directly on the wall. Okay, we have one other, a question from Mara Colechia. She says, the figurative style in this type of Mexican art is very unique, especially the soft, quite voluminous figures. Where does that vol volumetric type of figure come from? It's almost sculptural. Could, could you repeat the last part of the, of the, of the question because I didn't hear it? Where does the volumetric type of figure come from? It's almost sculptural. Well, yes, very, very, that's true, Mara. It's a, this is a, has a clear reference to the Aztec sculpture and all the, all the previous civilizations sculpture. You know, if you go to the National Museum of Astrology and you go and you see 
this culture of the of the of the Toltecs and the Aztecs is is very strong, very geometric. Is that that characterizes uh, Aztec uh, sculpture and uh, Toltec uh, sculpture? So this this is a clear reference to that. Does anybody have any more questions? Doesn't seem to be. Um, if you, this is Ginger here, if you do have any questions that come up, um, go ahead and email them to us. Um, I'll put our email address in the chat um, box, languageadventurepros at gmail.com. And so if you think of something this week, let us know and we'll send that over to Alberto to address at the beginning of the next session. I think something interesting that I, uh, is that um, Vasconcelos was just, uh, his, his idea was only to educate people through art. And he, he wasn't looking for a moral movement. He, 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 that, that was something he, he didn't visualize and he didn't like it even. When the, when the mural painters, and this is when something we're going to see the next session, uh, started to organize themselves as a movement, he was very angry. He, he had very many conflicts with the painters because they were organizing as a movement and he felt that he was um, uh, lo losing the control of, the, of, of all this program. So it's interesting, we consider Vasconcelos the father, uh, the political father at least of the Mexican mural movement, but he didn't want it to be the father. <laughs> See, that was uh, something that he didn't uh, promote. Are there any more questions? Okay, so I guess we'll wrap it up then. Um, next week is the last of the three-part series with Alberto Lenz. And um, you can find out more information about our the series. This series, you can see past recordings of uh, previous sessions, and you can register for our upcoming sessions on our website, which Ginger just put in the chat. Um, in that same link, languageadventurepros.com webinars, if you haven't had a chance to donate, um, you can do so on the website as well. Uh, we, next week, we have Alberto um, finishing up and we have Albert Coffey joining us um, for the first of a two-part series um, that talks about the origins of the Aztecs. So you can sign up for that. You can read more about that and sign up on our website as well. And um, I think, is that about it? Ginger, do you have anything else to add? No, oh, that's all. And uh, we hope to see you all next week. And thanks for coming today. And thank you so much, Alberto. Mm -hmm. Very informative. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. I, uh, I'll see you next Tuesday. And remember, I have a surprise for you, a, a very unknown mural by Tamayo. Okay. <laughs> Thank That's you. Exciting. We're looking forward Bye. to it, Roberto. Thank, Thank you. you for Bye. joining us, everybody. Adios. Adios a todos. Adios. Bye. Thank you.